<laughs> Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Good morning. Happy All Saints Day. Yeah. Or for a few of you who did a little too much Toastmastering last night, happy day of the dead. <laughs> Unlike many of the sessions that you have already attended this morning, this is not speaking training. You are not going to learn by design, nor probably by example, how to be a better speaker this morning. Instead, what this is, is you training. It is about learning to be a better version of yourself, how to find people who will help you to do that. We've all been to motivational speeches. We've all listened to someone stand up in the front of the room and get us all spooled up and excited, ready to go out and conquer the world, ready to go out and cure hunger, to s build world peace, to invent Twitter, and we go running for the doors and we get outside, I'm get, what are we doing out here? <laughs> this is hopefully not one of those speeches. I'm not trying to build some great shining example of who Kirk Carr is in your heart. What I would love to do is to teach you how to build the partnerships that you need to be a great shining example of you. In a very real sense, this is dream training. But it is about building achievable dreams, about leveraging your current skills, developing new ones, building on who is essentially you, and teaching others that you can be the one person who can solve the problems that they have. Now, dreaming is fun. If you were in Jim Key's creativity session this morning, and there were a few of us who were up early. Jim talked about daydreaming. And daydreaming is a lot of fun as a way to unleash your creativity. But daydreaming doesn't get us anywhere. Because to take our dreams from in here to out here requires hard work. It's not simply a matter of if I wish it, it will come. I need to do the hard work, and I need partners who will help me do the hard work. Because ultimately, to do our best, our most important work. We need to find partners who get it. Partners who will support and will strengthen us in our journey. I'm here to show you this morning how to find those partners. Ultimately, we do it by selling ourselves, by selling you. Now, that word has connotations. Many of us don't like that idea. We think of salespeople, we think of the pushy, pushy sales guy. The one who says, my pen or yours, you want to buy this. <laughs> you want to buy this. But that's only because your model for sales is far too restrictive. You've been scarred by bad experiences. Because when done right, sales isn't about pushing yourself on someone else. It's about calling them to you. It's about making them want to be your partner. It's about asking them to sit at your feet while you tell them how they can solve their problems and ask them to sign up and join with you on that journey. And if you can master that skill, you can conquer the world. And because that skill is actually much easier than most of us give it credit for, it's simply communication with purpose. And hey, gang, we're Toastmasters. Communicating is what we do. In this session, selling you seven steps to forging powerful partnerships for success, I will teach you how to do this. Now, as you might expect, this is a rather <coughs> unconventional sales seminar. <laughs> because it is ultimately not about selling others' dreams, others' visions, others' products. It is about selling your dreams and visions. You are the product. You might ask yourself, well, why do I have to sell myself? Why don't people just see me for who I am? And guess what they are? <laughs> Every single day, we sell ourselves by the way we dress, by the way we interact with other people, by the way we do our work, by the way we walk down the street or walk in a room. We sell ourselves. Does it not make much more sense to do that with purpose and intent than by accident? 
If we don't, we get locked into the roles that we've created for ourselves. We never have a chance to burst out and allow others to see who we are at our core. Now you might ask yourself, who's that handsome balding guy standing in front of the room that could tell us how to do that? Well, as my bio says, I'm a consultant. And yeah, I know that's got some connotations too, but I've done this for 21 years. I'm a business and technology consultant. I work with software. I also handle businesses and help them understand how to use that. I've been doing it for 21 years. 14 of those years, I've had my own business. I have a lot of experience in selling me. One of the guilty pleasures of self-help is reading about the stories of people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, for goodness sake, Attila the Hun, <laughs> all written by people who are not Bill, Steve, Warren, or Attila. The problem with these books is they're about outliers. They're about the 1%. The dirty little secret about the 1% is 99% of us are not going to get there. <laughs> you can lengthen your odds a little bit by at least having a plan B. This morning is success training for the 99%. It's for the ones of us who at least are willing to set up a plan B just in case we don't get to be Bill. <laughs> by most measures, I have been successful. I have my own business. I've made good money over the years. I'm not Bill, but it's okay. I have a loving family. I have a nice home, which is now in Florida instead of Ohio. That's successful. Yeah. 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 It's cold up there. It is cold up there. 41 <laughs> degrees in Akron, Ohio this morning. I check the Weather Channel routinely Woo. for cheap entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about how I've accomplished that. As you might expect, selling consulting services has some special and unique challenges associated with it. Largely because what I sell doesn't come in bright, shiny boxes splashed with big, bright logos and national advertising campaigns. What I sell is solutions to problems. Solutions to problems that my customers frequently don't even understand that they have. They're frequently shopping for a solution to the wrong problem. As you might expect, that poses some special challenges for my selling. Now, you might ask yourself, well, why do I care? I'm not a consultant. I'm a financial planner. I'm a project manager. I'm a scientist. I'm whatever you are sitting in your chairs. How does this relate to you? But if you want your opportunity to do your life's most meaningful work, the things that are truly important living inside of you, then you've got to have the ability to sell others on your dream and your ability to achieve that dream. You've got to convince them that you will be a partner in their success so that they can be a partner in yours. That you will be the exceptional person who can solve their problems for them. Because otherwise, what you're going to be is a worker bee. And let me tell you, that there's nothing wrong with that. If that is your goal, if that's what you want out of life, is to go in and have a steady job and a steady paycheck, and you're going to go in and do the same job every day, that is all right. But if you've got a dream that goes beyond that, you're in the right room this morning. Whether you're an entrepreneur trying to build a new business, or you're simply a professional looking for a good, challenging, straight job, this is where you want to be, because we all need to sell ourselves. And we sell ourselves in all kinds of places and in all kinds of ways. We sell ourselves when we talk to people at networking events, when we meet with customers, whether they're our customers, and if you're in a job, your employers, when you meet with team members, when you write a grant proposal, if you're in the public sector, you're a scientist, when you go on a job interview, when you speak or teach, when you're just doing your work, every one of those acts sells you. Because what you're telling people is, here I am. I am me. Do you want to work with me? Sure. sure absolutely. Yes. Now, you're saying this to others, and you might say, well, boy, that sure feels pushy. <laughs> and pushy is what we don't like about salespeople. But telling the truth, that's not pushy. And hoping that the right person gets that truth that's not pushy either. 
But what will happen is you're going to end up feeling like a square peg. Because that's different, isn't it? Not everybody does that. And it's tough to be a square peg in a world full of round holes. The trick to be an exceptional square peg is to figure out how to convince people that hiring an ex a square peg is an exceptional way to fill a round hole. And you can do that. Well, at least I've been able to do it. And I believe truly in my heart that you can too. But you're going to ask yourself, how do I do that? How do I accomplish that? How? If I am a project manager, do I not simply tell someone, hey man, I can play Microsoft Project like a Stradivarius? I can run a lean, mean project coordination meeting? No. What you want to tell them is, I get the broader picture. I get the big picture goals of the organization. I understand where this project fits in. I'm going to help you achieve those goals because Mr. CEO, I am a partner in your success. My goal is not to check off the little boxes on the project plan. My goal is to drive the business forward. How do you tell a grant writing agency, if you're a scientist, that if you want someone who can unlock the secrets of the universe for you, I'm the one. That can feel like an awkward conversation. But it is a vitally important conversation. Because by having that conversation, you are clearing the decks to do your life's work. I had, I'm an Ohioan, OK? I had to throw one small picture in. You can't start that conversation in front of the person you're trying to convince. You have to start that conversation at the beginning. Because this is a process. And this is the process. Now I will tell you that you don't need to, and this is in, your, in the books, you don't need, or I should say, I didn't start out with this as a program. I started my life out many years ago. We won't talk about my name. I started my life out many years ago fumbling my way through. And it was only looking back on it that I realized that this program existed, that there was a method to my madness. And this is the madness that I want to share with you this morning. The seven step program for forging powerful partnerships for success. It starts with visualization. The visualization of who you are, what you have to offer to the world, and who you want to work with. Who are the potential partners, the people who will understand that song? Then you need to build times in your life to accomplish that. You need to sing your song loudly and proudly so that people understand that you're out there and ready to work with them. You need to, when they hear your song, you need to interview them. You need to find out if they really heard the song, they really understood the mission. You want to get them to say no, and yes, that seems really counterintuitive. We will come back to that. You want to test when they say yes to see if they really meant it. And finally, you want to do the work and keep the faith. You want to live up to your end of the bargain. This process starts with the work. It starts by trying to get a sense of what is your life's work. What are the things that you need to do in life? It starts by looking in a mirror and understanding what's unique about you, what's important that you have to offer the world. Now, you may be going, doggone it, car. I don't have anything inside of me to offer the world. There's nothing in here. And if you truly, absolutely, in your heart believe that, then yeah, it's true. But if you humor me for a little bit, and you really think about why you've achieved the level of success that you have, why you've gotten to where you are, if you'll put your thinking cap on and really look at what got you to where you are, what the skills are, what's in your heart, you'll realize that you do have something to offer the world. And then you need to put your dreaming hat on. And you need to dream wildly. Again, for those of you who were in the session this morning with Jim Key, Jim Key talked about creativity, thinking creatively to get past your blocks. Well, this is nothing more than another writing block, friends. This is an imagination block. It's a you block. You need to get beyond it. You don't want to think about your current state, although that's certainly important. 
but you're probably not looking to continue from the same path. You may need to look back in life and look at a fork in the road that you never took. You may need to look forward and see a fork that's coming your way, but maybe it sen makes sense to run towards that fork rather than slouching along. Maybe it makes sense to approach that with purpose. And once you have dreamt wildly, once you've had this fun journey, then you need to do the reality check. Now, most people will go, well, the reality check says I can't achieve my dreams. Wrong. The reality check is about how we achieve our dreams. What are the steps that we need to take? If that dream's an important dream, and that dream represents the core of you, then there's nothing that prevents you from doing it other than your unwillingness to accept the reality of accomplishing it. Because in the end, what we are trying to do is figure out who we are and do it on purpose. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's from Dolly Parton, obviously. And I've always thought, Dolly ought to know. <laughs> that leads a lot of people to start with their resume. Resume thinking is what round pegs do, friends. Resume thinking is intrinsically self-limiting. It says, this is a little box that I fill in. This is all the little skills that I've got. We're building a box around our potential to accomplish things. As a consultant, I walked into, I've walked into businesses any number of times. I've done this for 21 years. I've been in hundreds and thousands of businesses over the years. In working with those companies, I will meet people working in low, low positions, little boxes, little cubicles that they've built for themselves. They may be a payroll clerk. They might be a purchasing person. They might be anything. And you sit down and you talk with them and you go, this guy, this person is really smart. They've got a good sense of what the business is, and there is not a single other person in the building who knows this secret. They have built boxes for themselves. They've allowed other people to build boxes for them. You can't build those boxes. You've got to push against the edges of those boxes, and yeah, people will push back. That's okay. If your only goal is to avoid pushback, you're probably not going to go very far, especially if you violate people's sense of who you are. They're not going to like it initially, but they will come to. You've got to push against expectations because ultimately those hard skills are simply a base camp for accomplishing the next step in your life's journey. They're simply a place from which you're going to kick off. Now, they also are your loss leaders. As a technology and business consultant, I work with a specific software package. That's what I do. It's part of my life. When I go and approach a customer, I approach them with a set of hard skills built around the way that I end up selling them. I set the hook with my soft skills. I set the hook with my Toastmaster skills of communication and leadership. I set the hook with my ability to organize work and get other people moving in the same direction. I set the hook with my emotional intelligence, my ability to manage relationships and help people accomplish their goals, and with my integrity. And then I ice the deal with my human skills, intelligence, curiosity, ferocious energy. These are all tough skills. These are not skills that many people are willing to exhibit, but they are skills that all of us have within us if we're willing to tap that vein. And they're because they're exceptional, because most people don't lead with them. You will stand out. You will be a psychedelically spectacular square peg. The most important soft skill, though, that you need is the skill of vision, the ability to visualize yourself as something other than the way the world perceives you today. And to do that, you've got to find an inner core of excellence, what is exceptional inside of yourself. We don't want to offer to the world what's average. We don't want to offer to the world what anyone can offer. If that's all we're offering, then we are anyone. We've got to find what's unique and exceptional inside of ourselves. This is as true for professionals as it is for entrepreneurs, as it is for any single individual sitting in this room. Every one of you has got something exceptional to offer the world. You need to hone in on it. You need to strip away all the crap and figure out 
what that is. And then you need to pursue excellence within that sphere. Last night, those of you who were Jim Key, I'm gonna keep borrowing from Jim Key because if you're gonna borrow, you wanna borrow from where the gold is. <laughs> Jim Key said excellence will cost you. It does not come for free. There's work here, but it is absolutely essential because there's no point in going out and offering exceptional mediocrity. Nobody's gonna buy that. You have to develop curiosity. Curiosity is one of the straps on which you will hone excellence. It's, if you don't have curiosity about what is your core vision, the thing that you're offering the world, you're probably not looking at the right thing, guys. You need to look someplace else. If you're not curious about it, it don't work. And then you need to wrap that around your problem-solving skills because ultimately what you're selling is the ability to solve problems for someone else. That's what they're buying. They're not buying a pretty face. They're buying an ability to solve problems. And then you need to get in touch with your persistence. Because none of this is easy. There will be failures, there will be pushback, there will be all sorts of obstacles that are in your way. And if you are not persistent, if you don't hang tough, you will fail. You will fail permanently as opposed to temporarily. And then you need to be concerned about specialized skills. Most people try and stick this way up front. They think about what I need to do, what I want to do, and then I need all these skills. I got news for you. In most cases, you can backfill skills. In most cases, all of those specialized skills are the result of doing the work over the course of many years. There are very few professions that you can go into where specialized skills are required up front. Now, I would not suggest that if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer that you avoid the certifications and training that go with that. But for most of the rest of us, we can backfill the specialized skills that are necessary to do that. And then you need to find your secret sauce. The thing that's inside of you that only you bring to the equation. I can't tell you what that is, but I can tell you that you all have it. And you need to find that and you need to fly that flag because if you don't, nobody's gonna see you. Nobody's gonna understand what you bring to the equation. And then, you need to find passion. Some of you who are well steeped in all of this self-improvement literature are going, wait dude, that belongs at the front of the deck. Because don't they tell you, I man, you go out and you work your passion, you find your passion. For most of us, the things that we're truly passionate about aren't things that other people are going to buy from us. For example, I am deeply passionate about my love for my wife, Julie. Yet, I would not expect people to pay for me to exhibit that love. <laughs> poetry, guys. I was thinking poetry. <laughs> you need to develop passion. If you truly found your life's work, then that passion will develop. And if that passion doesn't develop, then you probably haven't found your life's work. You've probably not found the thing that's going to drive you. And you need to reset, and you need to go back and look at it again. And finally, and this is the piece that many people skip, is you need to visualize who you want to work with. Who are the partners? Because if you don't visualize the partners, if you don't have an understanding of who that is, then anyone will do. And if anyone will do, one, you're not offering excellence, and two, it's probably going to be a disaster. You've got to have a clear vision of who you want to work with. In my business, for example, I told you that I work with a specialized software package. This package is designed to run small to mid-sized manufacturing companies. So I am looking for small to mid-sized manufacturing companies that use this particular software who are dissatisfied with the way the software is being used to run their business, who have not been able to get support in making that software work better from the company that sold it to them. I don't sell the software, I just help them use it smarter. But most importantly, I'm looking for companies that fit all of those definitions and also have leadership that has a vision of using that as a real tool that goes beyond just having screens running on desks, which unfortunately is the criteria that a lot of companies use. If I just took that at the software level, there is a prospect pool for me of 2,500 companies throughout the world. 
that I can approach. And if I start throwing all those other criteria in, trust me, that number gets a lot smaller. I've done this for 21 years. People start out thinking they have to please the world. You don't have to please the world. You've got to hone in and find that small group of people, that small group of potential customers who will get it. And you can make a pretty darn good living out of that small group. If you're looking for a straight job, that small group might be one special company that you're finding. It's real important to understand what that customer looks like, to quantify them, to drive a definition so that you can see them as a person, that you can have a conversation with them even if they're not in the room. And then you need to build time. Because you can't achieve these goals without any time, right? In my life, I have built time. I've organized my life and my business to be successful. And I've done that very simply by not living beyond my means. Because ultimately, what we're trying to do here is to give ourselves enough room to be able to succeed. And I'm fortunate that I have a wife who shares those goals. And you might ask yourself, well, why is that important? It's important because of this. Most of you, again, who've read the self-help literature, who does know this quote. It's from Robert Schuller, and it is his famous invocation to go out and be bold. It says, what would you do if you could not fail? What would you choose to do? If you knew you weren't going to fail, what would you choose to do? There's a problem with this, isn't there? Because we know we can fail even if we're doing something that we know stone cold, we can fail. And you know, quite frankly, most of the time, it's not the fear of the failure that gets us. What gets us is a catastrophe that can result from that failure. The fear that we're going to be out on the streets. The fear that we're, our wife and children are going to live in the back seat of our car, our Audi that we bought with all that money. This is what we fear. We're not looking for a chance to not fail. We're looking for a get out of jail free card. We're looking for a way to know that if we do fail, it's not going to be the end of the world. That get out of jail free card is our shot of courage. And we do that by living within our means. We do that because time is money in a very real sense. If you are familiar with entrepreneurship and you look at what the way entrepreneurs look at money, they have a term for it. They refer to it as runway. Runway is the amount of money that sits in the bank that they can use to get their business to take off speed and off that darn runway. And that is a very handy way to look at money. And if you can't do this, you're hobbling your chances for success. There are people who do it without having this, but it's a lot easier if you're not loading yourself up with debt, if you're not buying stuff, that you're making an investment in your future rather than an investment or spending money elsewhere. I'll give you an example from my life. Recently, we moved to Florida. It became obvious that I needed a new car. My old car was rusting down the Florida <laughs> highways, and it was a little frumpy. You know, I, I'm 54 years old. I wanted something that was just a little bit sportier than that. Now, I have a buddy who's into Porsches, loves Porsches, and he said, man, you need one of these like I got. He knew I was hunting for a new car. And technically, if we'd been willing to eat a lot of ramen noodles and Kraft macaroni and cheese, we might just barely have been able to afford the cheap one. <laughs> But every time I looked at that car, this is what I saw. I saw a little bit of fun tooling down the street in my Porsche and a whole lot of lost freedom. Lost freedom to say no to projects that didn't further my goals. Lost freedom to explore new opportunities. Lost freedom to do what was essentially me, to bring my gift to the world. In the end, what I bought was this. It's a little Subaru BRZ. It's a little sports car. It's a whole lot of fun, but it was about a third the cost of the cheap Porsche. I gave up nothing. I truly gave up nothing here, but I gained a lot of freedom. This is not a vow of poverty. It's a vow of freedom. It's a willingness to say, you know what, I'm not going to buy toys. I'm going to stick that money in me. I'm going to give myself a chance to succeed. And once you've built the time that you need to succeed, then you need to sing your song. You need to sing your song 
Because if you can know that you've got the answer to the world's problems, that if nobody hears you, if nobody else knows that, you're never going to have the opportunity to build that success. And this is the core of the sales process. Now, anybody who has been in a professional sales organization, has worked sales, or even gone to business school, knows what this is. This is the sales funnel. And the sales funnel is the classic definition of a sales model. The general idea is you take leads, all the people who are your son, you pour them into the top of the funnel, and then it is the role of the salesperson to jump up and down inside that funnel and shut those leads down into prospects and those prospects down into a few customers. And I will here to tell you that that is entirely the wrong model for what we're trying to achieve here. We aren't looking for a funnel. We're not looking to get tons of leads in. We're looking, our model is a sieve. What we want to do is get rid of all the people who don't get it, who might hear our song but don't get it, and leave behind just the few nuggets of gold, the ones with whom we wish to work with, the ones with whom we can work with to accomplish our life's goals and help them accomplish theirs, because this is always a two-way street. Because what we're trying to maximize here is time. Time is the only commodity that we have available to us that we cannot expand. And if we waste it, if we're frivolous with it, if we spend time working other people's goals and objectives, we lose time to achieve our own goals and objectives. It's that simple. So how do we create time? How do we accomplish that? We do it in the simplest way possible. We do it by seeking volunteers and not recruits. We are looking for a few people who get it, who step up to the plate and say, I'm in here with you. I am willing to do the work. In my business, I have a very unique value proposition. I tell my customers, I will drive your car while all the rest of you get out and push. Because it's a lot of hard work to accomplish what I do with my customers. And I got to tell you, that takes a special crazy breed of volunteer to be willing to sign up for that. But those are the volunteers that you want. Those are the volunteers that will help you. To get them, you've got to sing your song loudly and proudly in as many places as you can because you want to let people know who you are and what those volunteers look like. And the good news is, that we live in a world where it's easy to sing. There are all kinds of amplifiers available to us. We can blog, we can create e-newsletters, we can do public speaking, we can teach, we can do our job and make sure that we and others talk about it. We can be part of the community, not just the community in which we live, nor necessarily the community in which we work, the employ our employers, but also the broader professional communities that we inhabit. And even the Toastmaster community, there's a lot of communities to which we can affiliate ourselves. And we want to encourage our customers and our employers and all the people that we work with to sing about us too because we don't want to sing solo, we want a choir. We listen to choirs. So what do you do when someone steps up and they say, I hear your song? Well, your tendency is gonna be to go, whoopee, somebody heard my song. But what we really want to do is we want to do an interview. Most of you have the wrong model for an interview. Most of us, when we go apply for a job, we go to an interview and we're like, oh, please hire us. I need this job. I need this job. I need this job. You're interviewing them, gang. You're a square peg. Round pegs go and pray. We go and say, you, I'm going to make you want to work with me. And if you don't want to work with me, you're lost, dude. You do that not out of arrogance but because you're trying to find the right partners. Before you ever walk in the door, you need to know as much about the person sitting on the other side of that table or the company that's sitting on the other side of that table than, you, than they do. In my case, because I work with companies, I try to figure out what their products are. What are the markets that they serve? Who's who within the organization? What are the special business challenges that are facing that organization? I want to know as much or more about them as I possibly can before I walk in the door and associate you. The good news is it's not that tough. We live in the age of Google. 
Google is your friend. LinkedIn, use LinkedIn to your advantage. You're not on LinkedIn, get on it. And one of the advantages of LinkedIn is it's pretty easy to find ex-employees of the companies that you're going to go talk to. Ask them how it is to work there. What's the harm? The worst thing that they're going to say is, no, I'm not going to talk to you. That's the absolute worst thing that's going to happen. Everything else is uphill from there. Spend time learning about where you're headed. Figure out whether they're a good partner. And then when you get in the door, you want to interview them. Don't let them interview you. I mean, it's okay. They're going to ask questions, and that's cool. But the point of this is to interview them. It's to get a sense of who they are, and are they going to be a good partner. Be honest with them about what you will do for them. Make them be, and be honest with them about what you expect out of them, what their side of the equation is. Ask a ton of questions, listen carefully to the answers that they give, and even more carefully to the answers that they don't. Because there's a tremendous amount of information in that silence. What you're trying to figure out is do they get it? Do they understand who you are? Can they be a partner for you? Will the organization that they are working for understand? Will they get it? A lot of times I'll walk into companies and I'm talking to some guy and I thought this guy's got it and he has, but he's sitting in a dark little corner of the building and nobody talks to him. And he's planning to rely on me to leverage change in his organization and that folks doesn't work. That's not a good partner. Can you work with them? Does the guy have power? Can they hire you? Sometimes I'll talk to people and they don't even have the authority to hire me. And if they do hire me, can they pay the bills? Now you might say, well, as a consultant, I get that. As an employee, you better be paying attention to this too. If you're not paying attention to the financial stability of the organization that you're about to join, you're in for a rude surprise. Because it's easily, you're gonna end back in the unemployment line in six or nine months if this company is not financially solvent or if they're going to go through these big rounds of layoffs. There's no worse position to be in than to be six months down and then out of a job. You quit your old job and you've got to go back out and start it all over again. That's not fun. Remember that what you're looking for is not hundreds or thousands of customers or opportunities. You're looking for a few good ones. I can make a living, a very good living, with two to three customers a year. You probably need one good job a decade or every five years, depending upon what your professional advancement is. The whole point of this process, by the way, is to get to know. It's to get them to say no. Now, I know you're like, what do you mean, car? No, no, the whole point of sales is to get them to say yes. No, in this case, it's to get them to say no. And the reason for this is, if you've got all kinds of bandwidth, but individually, we're not big, we're small. We're tiny. And if we try to take on everybody else's business, we're gonna get overwhelmed. We don't have the bandwidth to process that. So for us to be successful, for us to do our life's work, we have to be choosy. And we have to be choosy because what we're trying to do is maximize time. We're hunting for those volunteers because the people who volunteer will step up and help us accomplish our goals but recruits will sit fidgeting in the back of the room and they're ready to bolt for the door as soon as the bell rings. Doing it with recruits is the toughest way to possibly accomplish your life's work. And once you've gotten them to yes, once you've gotten through that process of interviewing them, you got to yes, then you got to test. What you're testing for is to find out, okay, you said yes, but did you really mean it, dude? Is that really what you want? Can I, and then you're also testing and see, can you work with them? And can they work with you? Now, in my business, because I'm a consultant, I do this by doing a one to three day assessment of their business. It's a service for which I get paid. They write me a check. I go in the door. I spend a lot of time talking to power within the organization. I talk to the line employees. I spend a lot of time talking to them. And at the end, I'll give them an oral or written report. You may think, well, I'm an employee. I'm going to go get a job. I can't do that. But there's nothing that prevents you from saying to the, your potential employer, I want to spend a day with you. Not as a potential employee, but with my consulting hat on. And what you're looking for is to figure out where you would fit in the organization, what the culture and the feel of the organization is, not inside a conference room, 
but inside the offices. Don't let them sit you at a desk and try and do a job you've been hired for. You want to shadow people. You want to see how they're working. You want to get a feel and flavor for the organization. You can learn an incredible amount about a company by spending an unattached day inside of it. And it will tell you whether you want to work with them before you ever quit your old job. Bonus points, right guys? No is okay at this stage. In fact, if you're going to get to know, this is not the second best place to get to know. Recently, I had a gig. I went to a company in Michigan. We had a really good interview. I thought they got it. I thought they knew where they were headed. I spent three days on there interviewing people. I did a big written report. When I sent the report to them, they were so angry with it that they stuck it in a drawer and wouldn't show it to the senior leadership of the company. Oops. Except that it wasn't. Because we got to know. We got to know at the second best place we could have gotten. We could have gone forward and said, hey, you know, we're going to spend all of this effort trying to change the organization, trying to do all of this stuff, and we would have wasted my time and their time. The goal in this is to fail fast. If you're going to fail, fail fast. And move on to the next thing. Now, you might think, well, no, I don't want to fail. No, you have to fail. You have to fail because failure charts the boundaries of the possible. It establishes the edges of your universe. If you never explore failure, if you never test for failure, then you've got no way to know how far you can go. You're going to tread down that little path, the safe path. And guess what? That's a failure too. It's a failure of potential. It's a failure of yourself. And finally, when you get to the end of the game, you gotta do the work and keep the faith because the sale isn't done when the ink is drying on the contract or when you accept the employment agreement. <coughs> the work is done when you're doing the work. And this is not merely a matter of professional pride. It is also about a matter of singing your song and enlisting others to sing your song for you so that the next time you go out and you look for something to do, you've got a bigger choir singing with you. You've got a bigger group of people who are making your noise for you. So in summary, seven steps. Visualize who you are and what you've got to offer to the world. And visualize who the partners are who you're going to work with. Build time in your life to accomplish those goals. Sing your song loudly and proudly in as many places as you can. Interview them to know, get to understand who they are, get to know quickly if you're going to get there, test when they say yes, and finally do the work and keep the faith. Because in the end, that will make you the most powerful you who you can possibly be.